All right, grab your Bible this morning, open it to the book of Jonah. We're in the book of Jonah, and we're excited about that. And um, this is a great book. Um, we, we love this story. It's such a great story. And so we're going to continue the, the story of Jonah, and we're going to be in chapter 2. As we begin, I have, a, I have a question for you. Please don't raise your hand, though, or actually give me like a verbal answer. Just think about it, and you'll understand why. Have you ever made a really bad mistake? Don't, don't raise your hand. Just don't even make eye contact with me. Just like, yeah, just we all know it's everyone in the room, right? Maybe, maybe you made a, a bad financial decision, and now you're in debt a little bit, or you, you realize, hey, uh, we lost some money in that. Maybe um, I did this one time. Maybe you put your boots too close to the campfire, and they just burned up, like done that before. Maybe, uh, maybe you opened a bag of chips too hard and you pulled them and they went everywhere and they went flying everywhere. Maybe you, you've, you just made bad mistakes in your life. Maybe you cheered for the Seahawks one time. Um, all of these things are just mistakes, right? They're just mistakes. And I want us, as we think about getting to Jonah chapter 2, there's a difference between a mistake and disobedience to God. We've all had moments where we've disobeyed God too, where we hurt someone we loved with our actions or our words. Maybe we screamed at our kids out of an anger. Maybe we spent a whole season of our life addicted. Maybe we stole something. Maybe we dishonored our parents. Maybe we followed the world's idea of sexuality instead of God. These and many more are ways that we disobey God, where we say what I want and what I desire and what I hope for is more important than what God wants. All of these moments that we've regretted, what we did or what we said, are times that we've disobeyed God, that we've hurt others, and we've hurt ourselves. And we're asking a, a really important question this morning, and the question is, what do I believe about obeying God? And we're using the life of Jonah to study about the importance of obeying God, because it's a great study about that. And one of the things about Jonah that is just really interesting theologically and practically is in this story, we see the sovereignty of God. We see God sovereignly pursuing and chasing after Jonah and even making things happen, physical things happen, storms on a sea, fish coming to swallow him, actual awesome things that God is doing to pursue Jonah. But at the same time, we see Jonah's free will to get to choose to obey God or not. And that's just like our relationship with the Lord. He's pursuing, he's loving, he's working on our behalf, but we still get the choice to say, I, I wanna be in relationship with God. I wanna choose him as much as he's choosing me. And I wanna obey him because of who he is and what he's done in my life. And so that's what we see in the book of Jonah and that's what we see in our own lives as well. Well, last week we saw that Jonah did something more than just make a really bad mistake. He disobeyed God completely. God told him to go to Nineveh and Jonah ran the other direction, like literally. God told me to go east, I'm going west. And he literally gets on a boat and says, I'm getting as far as I possibly can from where God wants me to be. And so Jonah is disobeying. Now in his disobedience, he got himself in trouble. He got everyone around him in trouble. He's on a boat and now there's a storm and the sailors are wondering why they're in a storm and they discover that it's Jonah's disobedience that has them in the storm and Jonah's disobedience is now costing him greatly. But not only is it costing him, it's also costing possibly the lives of the sailors on this boat. And they're ticked off. They're mad at him. And so they say, what do we got to do to get rid of this? What do we got to do? And Jonah says, well, throw me overboard. And they hesitate a little bit, but eventually, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's get rid of you. <laughs> so the sailors throw Jonah overboard and, they, and the storm stops immediately. And they end up converting and worshiping God, which is great. And then, and then God causes a largemouth bass to come and swallow Jonah. It's not really in there, but I like it. It was a big fish. And that's where we leave our story. That's chapter one. That's where we leave our case study, Jonah, in the belly of a big fish. Now, I'm fairly positive. I haven't experienced this myself. I don't know if any of you have, but I've never been in the stomach of a large fish. Anybody else? 
Okay. I'm guessing that it's not a pleasant experience. Just supposing based on um, anatomy and the study of stomach acid, that it's probably not a great place to be. But Jonah's going to teach us something from the belly of that fish. Jonah's going to teach us that God can use stinky circumstances to get us back on track. And isn't God good that way? Like he uses our own failure, our own disobedience, when we're saying, I don't want anything to do with you. God says, that's okay. I still love you. And I can work even with your own disobedience. And I can still pour out my grace upon your life when you even don't want me to. And so God's going to use this stinky circumstance in Jonah's life to get him back on track. And the really good news about that is that we're often in stinky circumstances too, aren't we? And God will get us back on track too, because he's faithful. See, let me tell you something that is just so awesome about God and our relationship with him, especially because we've had a little bit of time now, especially because we're now post-Jesus. The grace gets even better. The mercy gets even fuller. The forgiveness comes in totality. So now those of us that have believed in Jesus as our Savior and Lord, it's even greater because the forgiveness is complete. And we've discovered that there's nothing he won't forgive. There's no place he won't go with us. No heartache, no pain, no circumstance, no bad decision, no disobedience that can separate us from God. Because God will always meet us in the middle of our mess when we humble ourselves and ask him to help. And that's exactly what we'll see in our story today with Jonah. See, we're no longer defined by our mistakes in God's eyes because Christ's forgiveness has covered us. There's nothing that we can do to disqualify ourselves from the grace of God because his mercies are new every single morning. And this is where we find Jonah. He's in a mess. A mess he created by disobeying God's best for his life. So God sends this great fish to swallow Jonah. And let me tell you something that is totally awesome about this fish that God sent and what it means. It means that God didn't give up on Jonah. That's what it means. Because God could have simply just let Jonah die. We mentioned this last week. There was another prophet alive at the same time as Jonah, and that was Amos, and he could have sent Amos to do the job. So God could have easily just let Jonah sink to the depths and pass away and come to heaven, and that's that. Story's over. Not a very good one, but it's one chapter. (laughs) That's it. There'd be a different lesson there, wouldn't there? The, The lesson would be don't disobey God or else. But now the lesson is different. Now the lesson is, even when you do disobey, God's right in the mess with you. And he'll rescue you. See, it means that God meets us in the middle of our mess too and helps us get back on track. The story of of Jonah reminds every one of us that God won't ever give up on us either. So look at Jonah chapter two with me. Um, This is an interesting part of the story. It's a little bit different than the rest of the story. Uh, But chapter two is Jonah's prayer. It's his prayer. It's his moment of talking to God after God's gotten his attention and worked on his heart a little bit. In chapter two, Jonah's in the the belly of the big fish. Uh, God's got his attention. And now Jonah is going to pray and talk to God. And we can learn several lessons about obedience from what Jonah says in his moment with God. So look at it with me. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me, and I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters covered, closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. 
I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their back on all God's mercies, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise and I will fulfill all my vows for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Awesome. The Bible's got the coolest stories in the world. I just want to say that right off the bat. The first observation we see in Jonah's prayer is a really important step in our obedience and our disobedience. It's this, that when we've disobeyed God, talk to God. If you've disobeyed the Lord, and you've probably had this from your past, one of the best things to do is just start talking to God. Now here's the challenge with, challenge with that. The best thing to do is the hardest thing to do. <laughs> Like none of us want to really talk to someone that we just hurt. Like when you're in a relationship with someone, if, we get, if Kate and I get in a fight and uh, I've gotten really mad at her, she's done nothing wrong, of course. It's always me. And I've yelled at her, I've screamed at her, I've gotten really mad at her. Like the last thing in the world I wanna do is go start talking to her again. Why? Because I know if I start talking to her, then the first thing I need to do is what? apologize. And I don't want to do that because I'm stubborn. And so here's Jonah. He, he begins to do the hardest thing in his relationship with God. He starts to talk to God. Now God's got him right where he needs him to be because his relationship with God is not going so well. But you and I have these moments where when we've disobeyed God, we got to get past the frustration, past how we feel, past the condemnation that the enemy of our soul is giving us, and remember that what? There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 tells us. Because if we start talking to God, we know that the next thing we will need to do is ask him for our forgiveness. Now, the best part about that is whenever we, are, we come to the Lord and we confess our sins to him, 1 John 1, 9 says that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Apologies are hard, but let me remind you something about apologies and forgiveness. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. That must be why God is so happy. <laughs> he has the ability to forget. Do you forget? I don't. I remember all my failures. How about you? Yeah. And I have an enemy of my soul that reminds me of them so regularly. And that's why talking to God on a regular basis is so important for you and me because it reinforces the hope that we have in the forgiveness of Christ. Now, verse one and verse two tells us that Jonah talked to God. Verse one says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from inside the fish. Good decision, Jonah. You've had a string of bad ones. You finally made a good one. In the middle of the fish, what should you do? Yeah, start crying out to God. That's a great decision. That's what verse two says. I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. I called to God from the land of the dead. This is what Jonah is doing now. He's, he's praying to the Lord. He's crying out to God. He's calling out to the Lord. See, this is important in the process of making our relationship with God right again. The first step in the process of making our relationship right with God is what we must do. We must take that step towards God. We must start talking to him, cry out to him, call on him, ask for forgiveness, recommit our life to him. This 
is our part. That's what we should do. That's what Jonah did. The second observation in Jonah's prayer is God's part. And it's that God will answer you when you talk to him. God will answer you. That's what verse two says, right? Verse two says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead and the Lord heard me. So the Lord's answering Jonah. The Lord's hearing Jonah. And this is good news that God will answer us when we talk to him. Now, this is a powerful hope when God answers. It, it brings hope to our, to our heart, to our mind, to our life. There's a genuine joy that rises up within, it, within us when we know that God is listening to our cries. That when we talk to God, he answers us and he listens and he cares. Dr. Helen Rosevere was a missionary to Zaire and she recounts a story in her diary while she was in the country of Zaire. She says that a mother at their mission had died after giving birth to a premature baby. She said, we tried to improvise an incubator to keep the infant alive, but the only hot water bottle that we had was beyond repair. So we asked the children to pray for the baby and her older sister. One of the girls prayed, Dear God, please send a hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, send a doll for her sister so she won't feel so lonely. That afternoon, a large package arrived from England. The children watched eagerly as we opened it. Much to their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. Immediately, the girl who was prayed earnestly started digging through the box, yelling, if God sent that, I'm sure he must have sent a doll. And she was right. The Heavenly Father knew in advance of that child's sincere request and five months earlier had had ladies in a prayer group include both specific articles in their package. See, God can answer your prayer five months, five years, five decades before you pray it. Because he's listening. Because he's answering. See, God will answer when we talk to him. Now, don't assume that the answer will be exactly what you like. <laughs> right? That's not what I'm implying. Someone once said, if the request we ask is wrong... God says no. If the timing of our request is wrong, God says slow. If we're wrong, just completely wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right, the timing is right, and we are right, God says go. And we have to remember that in this process, we're in relationship with God, and he knows everything, and we know practically nothing and so our prayer to him is really important. But it brings me to this interesting question. Why do we pray really hard when we're in trouble and not so much when life is going well? Like we all do that, right? Yeah. Jonah's doing it. Like he's praying now. <laughs> I mean, he's in the belly of a fish and he's crying out. He's begging God to, to help him out. But before what? I don't want to talk to God. God told me to do something I don't want to do, so I'm not talking to him anymore. I want to do what I want to do. In fact, I'll run the opposite direction and I'm not talking to him anymore until he starts doing what I want him to do. <laughs> Have you ever tried to do that? God don't work that way, does he? He's not your sugar daddy. Is this indicative of our relationship with God? Do we treat him more like a fire extinguisher than a papa daddy? It was for Jonah, and it is for us sometimes too. But once God had Jonah's attention, and Jonah humbled himself and began to cry out to the Lord, his heart began to change. And he began to look towards God once again, and in his free will, he chose to say yes to God. 
And he said, I'm going to obey. I realize I disobeyed. I'm sorry for that. And I'm, I'm ready to do what you want me to do. He cried out to God because he also knew that God was his only hope. His only hope was to cry out to God. Only God could rescue him from the circumstances that he was in, as crazy as they are. And this reminds us of our third truth from Jonah's prayer, that God rescues his kids. God's in the rescue business. Have you noticed that? I mean, he loves to rescue us. The cross is a great example, but there are so many others as well. In, chapter, in verse 6, Jonah says this, But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. I love all of Jonah's language in, in chapter 2. It's maybe a little exaggerated, but, um, but he, he just is so exuberant about everything that is happening. And he's loving the fact that God is rescuing him. See, God rescued Jonah and God enjoys rescuing his kids. It's something he's been doing for a long time. Adam and Eve, Noah, Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samson, Deborah, David, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel, Esther, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Elijah, the woman at the well, Zacchaeus in a tree, all the disciples in another storm in the Sea of Galilee. Can you say, uh, repeat? Peter, Paul and Silas in jail. We have story after story after story in our Bible of God rescuing his kids. He loves doing this. You probably have a story of God rescuing you. The moment you believed in Jesus, God rescued you from hell and, a, and an eternal separation from him. That's part of your rescue story. When the Holy Spirit helps you not to say hurtful words to someone else, that's God rescuing you. When God provides for you financially after you've made a bad financial decision, that's God rescuing you. When you choose to root for the 49ers, that's God rescuing you, people. <laughs> I was talking to someone the other day, and they were telling me because they were excited about how many days they had been sober. They shared with me the awesome story of how God had rescued them from a life addicted to alcohol, and now they, they want to use that freedom to help others be free in Christ too. See, God use their stinky circumstances to get them back on track. And now they're ready to help others get someone on track. And that's a great story. And that's what God does, because he rescues. And he loves to help us in the middle of our challenging times. In the process of being rescued, Jonah says something really interesting at the end of his prayer. Look at it with me. It's in verse 9. In verse 9, there's this conclusion to Jonah's prayer. And it's not just the conclusion to his prayer. It's kind of the conclusion to all of the events in chapter 1. Like everything that's happened. God giving him direction, him ignoring it, going the other way, finding a boat, getting on the boat, the storm, all of it. And we don't really know how long that would have taken, a month, three months, whatever. This verse 9 is really a culmination and a conclusion of his thoughts, of his heart, of his spirit, of his relationship with God. And, and this is exactly where Jonah is at. And here's what Jonah says in verse 9. He says, I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. And I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Now, Jonah really says three things here. And there are three things that have to do with our obedience as well. Look at what Jonah says with me. Here's what Jonah says about obedience. The first thing is this, that obedience is joyfully making sacrifices for God. That's what Jonah says. I, I, I'm going to praise the Lord. And I'm going to make sacrifices for God. But I'm excited to do that now. That's what obedience is. It's joyfully making sacrifices for God. 
Jonah's in the belly of a fish and he's praising God. He's saying, I'm excited. I know I'm in a crazy spot right now, but I'm excited that my relationship with God is right again. And so I'm gonna praise him. I'm gonna glorify him. Now, why would he do that? Because he's excited about being with God. Because obedience is a joy for those who are in relationship with God. Same is true for us today. Obedience for us today means we are going to make sacrifices to live for Jesus. And we're not going to be upset about it. We're not going to be sad about it. We're not going to be like, oh, I'm so disappointed I have to obey Jesus today. We're excited about it. There's a joy inside of us. We actually have fun saying no to the world and yes to Jesus. It becomes something that wells up within our spirit and we are excited to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and say yes to him and no to the world. Paul says it like this to Titus, one of his disciples in Titus chapter two, verses 11 to 14. He said, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Paul makes it very clear that obedience is joyfully making sacrifices to God. The second thing that Jonah said is this. Obedience is being committed to God's truth and the promises we make to him. Jonah said it this way. I will fulfill all my vows. Now a vow is just an Old Testament word for a promise. I made some promises to God and I haven't been following out on, on my end but I'm going to start. I'm going to start obeying God again. I'm going to, I'm going to fulfill the promises that I've made to him. Now, Jonah, he made a promise to be a prophet of God. And that's interesting because that meant living a completely different life than everybody else. It meant that he had to deliver God's messages, even when they were difficult. Being a prophet was not an easy life. It was very sacrificial. Jonah lived a very different life compared to everyone else. He was a representation of God, an ambassador of God, someone who spoke for God. And he's now saying, I'm recommitting my life to that. Now, I would say the same is true for you and me right now in 2023. As those who believe in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus today, we are called to live that kind of life that Jonah was living then. We're called to live a different life than the rest of the world. We believe different truths. We hold to a different set of values than the world. We choose to be obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit and to God's word because we love him and we want relationship with him. This is what you and I do to be obedient and to be committed to God's truth and the promises that we make to him. The third thing we see is Jonah says, obedience is the desire of our life because God has saved us. Because God has saved us, obedience becomes the desire of our heart and our life. Jonah said it like this, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Now, I love what Jonah does here. He makes a personal statement. He makes a personal declaration. And every single one of us has to do the same. We have to decide, is it going to be my life to obey the Lord, to live for Christ, to not live for the world, but to be caught up in what God has for me? So it's a statement also for Jonah from personal experience. Jonah's been thrown in the sea where he thought he was going to die. And now God has saved him with a big fish. So there's some personal experience here that Jonah has of being saved in a very radical way. Now, I think for all of us, this would be, this would be life-changing. I don't know about you. If, if anyone in the room 
um, has ever had a radical life-changing experience with Jesus, it'll change everything and kind of become the foundation of your life moving forward with Jesus. Now, for all of us, uh, that moment is the day that we said yes to the cross of Christ. The day that we said, yes, I believe in Jesus as my savior and I believe that he rose again for me. That's that moment that you and I can go back to and say, that's that moment where just like Jonah, we were sinking in our sin and headed for spiritual death and Jesus met us in that place and rescued us. We believe in Jesus as our savior and Lord and now we live as people that have been saved by our God. Jonah also says this salvation comes from the Lord alone. In other words, his declaration is this, that like what he said in, in verse eight, that there's no other gods. All this worship of false gods is nonsense because only God alone can save. You remember the sailors cried out to their God on the boat. Could any of their gods stop the storm? No. No. But in one instant, God made the storm as calm as water skiing lake, just glass. See, Jonah says, only salvation comes from the Lord alone. We get to also make the same declaration as believers in Jesus. There is no God like Jesus. No other God, and I use that word loosely because no other gods even exist. They're just religious ideas and myths. But no one has done what Jesus has done. It's not even an idea in any other religious system or structure. Because no other religious structure even would go that far to say that their God would come and die for them. But Jesus did. Only Jesus left all of his glory in heaven to die for us and come back to life. This is why we choose to be obedient to Christ and his teachings and, and serve him with all of our heart because obedience is the desire of our life because Jesus has saved us. Now, the last thing that Jonah says, or really that chapter two says, Jonah's prayer's over, but this is the last thing that Jonah chapter two says. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Now, some other versions will say, uh, Jonah was vomited out on the land. That's probably actually a little bit more accurate. Um, and I would just like to say, could we all celebrate that we've never been vomited out of a fish? Yeah, I'd just like to say, thank you, Jesus. I'm good. I don't need to ever be vomited out of a fish. I promise to obey you all the days of my life. We're all good with that, right? But here's what's interesting. As Gross as this sounds, right? Being vomited out of a fish. What is that? It's God rescuing Jonah. That's what it is. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's gross. But it's God rescuing. Can I also remind you of something gross? A man being whipped over and over and over again for our healing the Son of God, being nailed to a cross and dying one of the most torturous deaths we've ever devised as humankind for you and me. It's disgusting. It's vile. It's gross. It's embarrassing beyond belief. And that's how much Jesus loves you and me. That's how much he wanted to rescue you. Not just for salvation's sake, but for your whole life and for all eternity. And so can I just say right now, whatever you're in the middle of, God's right there with you. Whatever you're struggling with right now, God is right there with you. And he knows exactly how you feel. God the Father knows exactly the struggle you have. Jesus knows what pain feels like. He knows the struggle intimately that you are in because he's been in it himself. And he can say to you, I'll walk through this with you. And there will be times where you can say, you'll say, Jesus, I can't even walk anymore. And he'll say, I'll carry you. I'll carry you. I'll heal you. I'll take care of you. 
But here's the challenge. It requires us to surrender to him. Just like Jonah. Get to that place where we just say, Jesus, I humble myself to you. Would you just take over? I'm going to stop fighting. I'm just going to be still and let you do the fighting for me. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to struggle anymore. I'm not going to get anxious. I'm not going to fret anymore. I'm just going to give it to you. And with Thanksgiving, I'm going to continue to be in relationship with you because I know you want to rescue me. And I know that you can use the circumstance that I'm in right now to get me back on track or to bring the healing that I need. Jonah reminds us that God was still working while Jonah was running. And God was pursuing Jonah when Jonah was ignoring God. And God was rescuing Jonah even when he didn't want to be rescued. Because that's who God is. This is who he is. This is who we serve. He's the one who loves us unconditionally, is faithful when we are unfaithful, and is always pursuing a relationship with us. So what should we do when we find ourselves in a stinky circumstance? Pray. Choose to get back on track with God. Cry out to him. Set your heart towards him. And when others see our choice to get back on track with God, it'll encourage them to do the same. Remember, most of our messes turn into a message. A message about how Jesus rescues. And almost every testimony I've ever heard started with a test. It's in the middle of those times when you and I are like Jonah in the belly of a fish in some sort of crazy circumstance, stinky circumstance, whether we got ourselves there or somebody else put us there or it's just life. Whatever it might be, let's choose to bring God into the middle of it with us. Would you stand with me? Let's just take a minute and just respond to the Lord. And I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come into this moment right now and just begin to work in every one of our hearts. And so would you just close your eyes and let's respond to the Lord this morning. I just want to ask us a question. I want to ask us that if you're in a season of life or a circumstance right now, and it's very challenging. It's a stinky circumstance. And it's tough right now. What you're going through is very difficult. It's challenging because maybe you did it, but maybe somebody else did it to you. It doesn't really matter. But the circumstance just really stinks. And you would just like to say right now this morning, Lord, I need you in this mess. I need you to come into my mess right now because I can't do this without you. If that's where you're at, would you just raise your hand and just say that to the Lord? Lord, here I am, you see me. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. Good. I want to pray for you. Jesus, I just pray for those that just raise their hands to say, this mess I'm in, Jesus, I just want to surrender it to you. I want to give this moment completely to you. All of the circumstances that might be wide and varied and extremely difficult, we give them all to you, Jesus, knowing that you are the God who heals. You are the God who gives us grace to walk through anything. You are the one that gives us strength and helps us live by the power of the Spirit, not by our flesh. Lord, whatever the circumstance might be, I pray that you would help every single one of us to discover that the most important thing is to pursue our relationship with you. 
You never guarantee that our mess will be completely dissolved instantly and immediately. But you do guarantee that you will walk through it with us. You do promise us that you will never leave us or forsake us. And for that, we are thankful. I pray that would be true for every single person that raised their hand. That you would not leave them, that you would not forsake them, that they would know that you are right there with them right now. While they go home and spend the rest of this day coming back to Candy Corner Carnival and just hanging out and whatever this week holds, would they sense your presence with them? Would the hope of Christ and the joy of the Spirit be resident in their soul? We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lots to learn from Jonah, huh? Yeah, you never thought you could get that out of the belly of a fish, did you? <laughs> That's good. Well, I'm glad you were in church this morning. Hey, remember Candy Corner Carnival, um, 3 o'clock. But if you're like super excited about Candy Corner Carnival, I mean, like you're about ready to jump out of your shoes right now. And you want to come back after second service and help us prepare, you certainly can. We will not turn that away, right? So lots of fun this afternoon as we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus to our community. Always remember, Jesus loves you very much. So do Kate and I. Have a great week.